ship Housatonic under the cover of darkness. Their weapon, an 18-foot pole with an explosive charge at its tip. February, I'll take my crew to Hunley, out on Rattlesnake Shoal, and any ship we come in contact with, we will sink. With the Housatonic only four miles out, they knew that they could just go out in about two hours and get it. And they went out about 7 o'clock at night, and they reached their destination at about 8.30, from all eyewitness accounts from the sailors on the Housatonic. And they ran the charge in and backed away. And the only thing that seemed to have gone wrong with the attack was that they were only about 60 to 80 feet away from the Housatonic, when they wanted to be 150 feet away. And they were spotted as they sort of broke the surface and came close. So they were, they were met with bra a barrage of small arms fire. No one really knows what happened next. Either the Hunley was too close to her own blast, or water may have swamped the boat. But at the moment of triumph, there was tragedy. And while the recent raising of the wreck may offer some answers, it's more likely that the truth sank with the crew when the Hunley went down to the bottom for the third and final time. One of the uh, names given to it here in Charleston was the murdering machine. Now, since it killed three crews during testing, was that nickname because it killed crews, or was it the nickname the murdering machine because it went out and murdered Union sailors on their ships? Either way, the murdering machine had made history, carrying out the world's first successful sinking by an underwater craft. But the Hunley was more like a human-powered torpedo than a real submarine. Even as she came to rest on the ocean floor, others were developing the concept of an unmanned torpedo. Robert Whitehead was an English engineer working for the powerful Austro-Hungarian Empire in the early 1860s. Whitehead, who must be one of the most brilliant applied engineers in history, who immediately came to the conclusion that actually if you had a weapon that could fly quite deep and away from the immediate uh, influences of the surface and so on, um, and you made it totally locomotive, now you have um, really quite an effective um, weapon that can be delivered from quite a range. Whitehead says, well, wait a second. If I can make a little compressed air motor, it doesn't have to be very powerful because I, I package all this in a little package. And in effect, he makes a, a, a self-guided submarine, right? Because the thing travels underwater. He calls it an automobile torpedo because it's, it runs itself rather than just being pulled. At first, it's a very primitive animal. It makes maybe uh, nine knots. But it has very interesting potential. By the late 1860s, the Whitehead torpedoes were functional, but not yet effective. Fifteen years later, they were being launched off crude platforms from the decks of warships. The first use of a Whitehead in history occurred in 1877, when the Shah fired a weapon against the Waskar, which had been pinched by a Peruvian pirate. That first torpedo actually missed, probably because the torpedo was slower than uh, its quarry. The Whitehead torpedo was problematic because it couldn't keep its depth, it didn't steer straight, and it didn't go very far or very fast. And all three of those things had to be settled before it could work effectively. The critical breakthroughs were the gyroscope, which enabled it to keep a steady course, improved depth keeping systems, basically flotation chambers, and a much improved engine which provided greater power and longer range. And these things come together by 1905, 1910 to create the weapon that in the First World War will transform the battlefield at sea. But before that could happen, the torpedo needed better launch capabilities. If it could be launched from submarines instead of the decks of small surface craft, it could become a devastating instrument of war.
Enter the unlikely catalyst, John P. Holland. It would be the tireless efforts and ideas of this little-known Irish immigrant that would create the perfect delivery platform for the torpedo. In November 1873, Holland arrived in the United States, where he would make his name as the father of the modern submarine. John Philip Holland was a rather unlikely submarine designer. He was a Christian brother. The Philip was actually the name he'd taken as a Christian brother. Uh, he was a teacher, although not that effective a one, apparently. But he had a passion for, for technology. He could really, it was found, he could, he could explain technology more than other subjects. And he had a great flair for invention. And as a patriotic Irishman who had emigrated to the United States in the aftermath of the, of, of the famine, he became associated with the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Fenians, as they were called. It was the Fenians who funded Holland's early attempts to build a submarine so that they could strike at the British Navy. His most notable effort was known as the Fenian Ram. He actually rather fell out with the Fenians. The money ran out. And quite soon, in fact, Holland was getting as frustrated with them as he was for a while with the United States Navy. But as time went by, he decided that his role was, was to um, design a submarine for his adopted country, which, of course, he did. When the US Navy held a submarine design competition in 1893, Holland's inventive engineering skills produced the clear winner. That submarine became the Holland V. It was uh, steam driven. It was 85 feet long. It was 68 tons. It was a big boat. The reason he used steam was because the specifications the government insisted on were so high in horsepower required and speed that he couldn't get it with any then known internal combustion engine. And steam was the only power that could do it. The steam plant was not insulated. So when it was fired up and the hatches were closed, the heat inside became totally intolerable. The ship was a disaster. It never did work right. By 1896, he's looking for backers to build another sub. Also, he's figured out that what he really needs are a combination of storage batteries and electric generator. Storage batteries for underwater power, electric generator to repower them when he's on the surface. Holland found what he was looking for at the electric boat company run by Isaac Rice. Rice agreed to fund Holland in exchange for the rights to his submarine patents. And that was the birth of the Holland Six, the submarine that laid down key principles upon which modern boats would be constructed. Once submerged, she was powered by batteries that could be charged on the surface by an internal combustion engine. She had a hydrodynamic shape, a fixed center of gravity for stability, and a reserve of positive buoyancy. Another revolution was the use of multiple trim tanks, Many of the earlier boats had very large tanks that were either partially full or they had steam boilers. Either case was very, very dangerous. Any down angle or up angle on the boat would cause the water to rush to one end or the other and the boat would stand on end. Such was the common thinking at the time then that a submarine had to be level diving in order to be safe. Well, John Holland blew that theory out of the water. By filling his tanks up completely and then using just very small tanks to adjust the trim, his center of gravity was stationary. This allowed him to travel up and down on an angle, porpoising, uh, basically operated a submarine like a fish. Therefore, the Holland dove like a modern submarine does. One of her first dives was on the vault day, St. Patrick's Day, and uh, it had been raining, and when he came up, the, it was a rainbow. It, it, it was almost too good to be true, like a stage setting, you know. <laughs> but uh, from then on, the Navy began to get, take an interest, and it sent its naval board to inspection. But they found problems. The Navy had complained that it behaved like a